I have for you this week a simple letter written by Pope Pius VII that he released at the start of his pontificate. It was addressed to the clergy. It's a striking look at a newly ascended pontiff and the fear that he was truly, truly experiencing, who probably didn't expect to ascend to the throne of Peter, and who clearly did not really think he was cut out for the job. Think about this in terms of what we see today, and what it must have been like having pontiffs, priests, and bishops who actually were worried about preserving the deposit of the faith, who were primarily concerned with the state of the church and its role as teacher of the faith in turbulent times. Pius VII reigned from 1800 to 1823, which was a time of great turbulence in Europe and in the church. He saw changes in the world that would have been unfathomable in his time, and you can see that he is left in awe and fear of taking his post in such times. This letter is food for thought in our times, which may turn out to be equally treacherous when looked back upon in the future. But enough from me. Pope Pius VII's address at the start of his pontificate. Venerable brothers, called by your suffrages, by the inscrutable judgment of God, to the supreme government of the church, we ascended to the pontificate, not without grave disturbance of our soul. In fact, if each time, even in times propitious for the church, the episcopate is resolved in a heavy commitment, what do we think it can be in the future? in hostile, turbulent, and difficult times. What times are we going through? Our soul trembles in facing the duties of the supreme pontificate and in considering, at the same time, the difficulties of our times. We know what mission the pontiff must carry out for the protection and health of the Catholic flock. We do not know how it can be lent while the most unbridled license, the repression of every right, both human and divine, the contempt of the priesthood, and the present captivity of the church are raging. These are the realities that agitate and upset our soul, and that do not allow us to be serene, tormented as we are night and day by the thought of such a burdensome task. Yet you have elected us to the supreme government of the church at this very time. Have you judged us capable of piloting the bark of Peter in the midst of storms raging everywhere and capable of bearing with our strength this weight of which even angelic shoulders would have a sacred terror? But in which group did you choose us? Certainly in that in which one would hardly find someone who, in these times, or his admirable faith in serving the church was considered not only the strongest, able to bear the absconding of goods, the Im imprisonment, exile, bitter dangers of death, and therefore was an object of wonder for the world, for angels and for men in the name of Christ, someone who was not only worthy of so much honor, but also far more capable than us in bearing such a burden, with the greatest glory and security of the church. What were your decisions then? You had at your disposal very wise men to whom to entrust the church, in time to rage with the storms. Why did you want to entrust it to a fool? You had very holy men at your disposal. Why did you choose a sinner? Was it that our weakness, recognized by all, escaped your insight so much that in such an evident case you alone have not noticed anything? Did that spirit that illuminates and indicates who to elect was absent from you while your choice fell upon us? Certainly was not so, we say it with confidence, venerable brothers, and we say it not to our glory, but to God's glory. He was present. God was present to your most holy minds, and we were the only ones that you had to choose in any case. Because? Because in your eyes, we were certainly did not appear worthy, but in the eyes of God, we appeared among all the weakest. And God, to confuse the pride of the strong, always takes advantage of the advice of the weak in governing his church. In truth, the more fragile the means he uses, the more evident it is that God has roots in heaven as Chrysostom teaches, and that God protects her everywhere. Please recall the beginnings of the nascent church. If therefore in those early times the fishermen, Peter and a few apostles, called from the darkness of Galilee to the light of men to announce the church, under the guidance of God, did so much that their voice spread throughout the earth. It must be seen as extraordinary, but certainly not new, the fact that on this island a refuge was also offered to us who, stripped of everything, asked to provide for the church after a long rage of storms, and this by admirable providence of God, and by concession of the august emperor, from whom we hope to obtain nothing that does not help the defense and greatness of the church. From the monastery of that order, to whose most holy rules we were educated, we have been called to govern the church, so that it will be God who will rule his church. What are we? If we are not sure of the protection of such a great ruler, aware of our weakness, acquiescence to his providence alone, would we take no care of the Christian flock? Indeed, the more industrious we will be, the more we recognize ourselves as weak, and we will serve the church as if we had nothing to hope or expect from divine providence. 
Maybe we pretend to dominate a reality so complex, so serious, so dangerous with our strength alone. But how will we be able to bear so much trouble alone? So much burden of duties if you, venerable brothers, are not at our disposal with your help. You understand how unhappy the condition of the Christian world is. You see how much help and so much corruption of customs Christian flock needs for its own salvation. Therefore, you who overwhelm us in great part by age and wisdom, help us. We ask you for the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us with your advice. Let us know what needs to be uprooted or planted or destroyed or built. Alleviate with your strength the burden that you place on our shoulders. We wholly promise you that your work, your advice, your help will be very welcome at all times. Could all this be enough? Certainly it is enough to help us, but it is not enough for the glory of the church, for the promotion of the Christian world. The church, venerable brothers, needs our good examples. In recent years, the priesthood has received deep wounds, and with what glory it is, not worth remembering. Perhaps in no other time before, the church was ennobled by so many triumphs of tenacious fighters. In order not to recall, among these, your admirable champions, the memory of the Most Holy Father and our predecessor suffice, who, due to the great weight of the troubles endured in the name of Christ, attained immortal glory. How great was his faith! How firm is her! What his constancy! not only in defending the church, but also in going towards death, for it, so many dangers, tribulations, and pains. Will we therefore believe that this so serious and painful affliction was inflicted on the church by God without an arcane plan of divine providence? That wise man asks us for the faith and perseverance of the priesthood in order to show off to the whole earthly world the great advantages achieved in this tribulation of ours, so that everyone understands that not in the riches of which we were deprived, not in the pomp that the hatred and slander of the enemies produced against us, not in all manifestations that are more fitting to the profane than to Christ's followers, but rather in the contempt for riches, in humility, in modesty, in patience and in charity, and finally in every priestly duty, the image of our Creator is represented, the authentic dimension of the Church is preserved. It is time to wrap up. Venerable brothers, we well know how much, in your opinion, is to be ascribed to our frailty, how much we owe to you. Trusting in divine help and with your advice, we will strive to give back and do what we owe with all zeal and faith. Let us therefore pray to God to assist us in our purposes, and with his grace, the more our weakness is manifested to all, the more evident his divinity may shine and be admired in the government of the church. And my only thought on all reading this is... It would be nice to have a, p a pope who was that humble and relying that much on the priests and the bishops and who could trust them that much. Thanks for listening. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.